In this video, we will be explaining St. Thomas Aquinas's On Being in Essence, chapters 1 through 3. In Latin, this book is called De Ente et Essentia. In order to understand this book, we need a quick Latin crash course. That's because St. Thomas uses certain words which do not translate easily into English, and so it's important to know what the English words correspond to. Memorize the meaning and standard translations of the words ens and esse. Esse is the Latin infinitive, which can be literally translated into English as to be. Infinitive verbs are verbs like to run or to dehydrate. Common translations of St. Thomas's word esse are to be, that would be a literal translation, or being, or even existence. The Latin word ends is literally translated as being. Ends is a participle or noun like running or runner. Common translations of ends are either a being or just being. Notice that essay and ends are sometimes translated using the same English word. Nevertheless, they do not mean exactly the same thing, so it's important to try to be aware as much as possible whether the English word being in the text you're reading is describing essay, is it a translation of essay, or is it a translation of ends? What is De Ente et Essentia? that is, St. Thomas's book, which we translate in English as On Being in Essence. This book was written early on in St. Thomas's career, sometime between 1252 and 1256 AD. St. Thomas at this time was a young student and not yet a master of theology. The book was written to help his classmates understand Aristotle's metaphysics. This book is a study of the most basic concepts in metaphysics. In fact, the most basic concepts, period. Being, or ends, which appears in the title of the book as ente, and essence, or essentia, which also appears in the title of the book, de ente et essentia. St. Thomas begins this book with the following quotation. A small error at the outset, that is, a small mistake concerning principles, can lead to great errors in the final conclusions. But the principles for the entire intellectual life are the concepts of being, or ends, and essence, or essentia, which are the first concepts to fall into the mind. Thus, we must investigate ends and essentia, starting with what is more easily known about these and proceeding to what is more obscure. Notice the line of reasoning here. If we do not investigate ends and essentia and, through negligence, make some mistake about what beings are or what essences are, then we're liable to make very great mistakes later on in any science or investigation. Since being and essence are the first ideas to fall into our mind, in order to not mess up in all future science and all future investigations, we need to make sure we understand what the words being and essence are. These are the most simple and original ideas that fall into our mind. In order to fulfill this task, St. Thomas proceeds in the following way through the course of this book. First, he starts with sensible substances and explains how essence is found in sensible substances. This happens in chapters 2 through 3. Next, St. Thomas deals with how essence is found in immaterial substances, or what he likes to call simple substances. These are angels, the God, and the human soul. 
This happens in chapters 4 through 5. Finally, St. Thomas addresses how essence is found in accidents. This happens in chapter 6. Notice that although this book is technically about being, ends, and essentia, most of the book focuses on essentia. In chapter 1, St. Thomas alludes to something that Aristotle says in book 5 of his Metaphysics. Aristotle says that there are several senses of the word being, ends, or is, which in Latin is est. The word is just means is a being, and so the senses of is are also the senses of being. Aristotle says that being, or ends, can either mean accidental being, which in Latin is called ens secundum accidens, or ens per accidens, or being might mean essential being, that is, ens secundum se, or ens per se. Accidental being is what is expressed by the word is in sentences like Socrates is just, or the just is Socrates, meaning the just person is Socrates, or the just is pale, meaning the just person is pale because Socrates is pale. Each of these three sentences uses the word is to express accidental being. That's because the compound of subject and predicate in each of these cases is a composition of an accident and a substance, or of two accidents within a substance. Thus, in each case, we have an accidental composite of multiple beings. Essential being is divided into being that is divided into the ten categories and being that signifies the truth of a proposition. This is often called in abbreviated form by the Latin phrase ens ut verum, or being as true. Being that is divided into the ten categories posits something in the nature of things. That is, it, it signifies something positive and outside the mind. Being that is divided into the ten categories is uh, thus the positive categories and what falls under them, namely substance, quantity, quality, relation, etc. All of the ten categories that Aristotle lists in the book The Categories, and whatever falls within those categories, is in this first kind of essential being. The second kind of essential being, that is, ens ut verum, includes anything that can be signified by an affirmative proposition. For instance, Homer is blind. From this proposition, which is affirmative, we can conclude that blindness is a being. Now, obviously, blindness is not a being in the sense that it's some positive thing outside the mind, since blindness is, in fact, outside the mind, a non-being, the absence of the ability to see in something that can see. Nevertheless, anything that can be put into an affirmative proposition is called a being in the sense of the truth of a proposition, or in dut verum. So even non-beings and negations are considered beings in the second kind of essential being, that is, in dut verum. But in the first kind of being, that is, the being that is divided into the ten categories, only positive things are called beings. Now both the being that is divided into the ten categories and the being that signifies the truth of a proposition are divided into actual being, or being in act, and potential being, or being in potency. All of this is described in Aristotle's Metaphysics, Book 5, Chapter 7. In On Being in Essence, Chapter 1, although St. Thomas alludes to Aristotle's division of being from Book 5 of the Metaphysics, Aquinas does not bring up the entirety of Aristotle's division from that other work. Instead, Aquinas just focuses on a part of that division, namely the division of being into, on the one hand, being that is divided into the ten categories, and on the other hand, being that signifies the truth of a proposition, or ens ut verum. Aquinas brings up this division in order to say that 
in this book on being an essence, he's not going to be talking about the being that signifies the truth of a proposition. Instead, he's going to focus on the being that is divided into the ten categories. This being, Aquinas says, is etymologically related to the word essentia, or essence. That's because ens, or being, signifies that which has esse, or that which has existence, quod habet esse. And essentia is obviously etymologically related to esse. Now that we've discussed the division of being and which part of this division is relevant to the present book, and now that we've seen the way essence is related to the part of being that is relevant to this book, we can now discuss the outline of this book. The rest of this book is going to be concerned not with being principally, but with essence. The chapters are divided into the different ways in which essence can be found. Chapters 2-3 through three discuss essence as found in material substances. Chapter 2 in particular looks at wh what is the essence of a material substance. Chapter 3, on the other hand, looks at how the essence of a material substance relates to the logical intentions, genus, species, and difference. Chapters 4 through 5 look at essence as found in immaterial substances, such as God and the angels. Chapter 4 in particular looks at how essence is found in these immaterial substances, and chapter 5 compares how essence is found in material substances, angels, and God. Chapter 6 closes out the book with a study of how essence is found in accidents. Before closing chapter 1, St. Thomas gives several words which signify the same thing as essence. Essence is that through which a thing has existence. Another word for essence is quiddity, or whatness, or what it is to be. The phrase what it is to be is a technical phrase coined by Aristotle. In order to abbreviate this phrase, other later authors use the word whatness, or quiddity. Whatness and quiddity are exactly the same as one another. That's because the word quid in Latin just means what. So quiddity is a transliteration of the Latin word quiditas. Whatness is a translation of the word, which means exactly the same thing, but which doesn't look like the Latin word, whereas quiddity looks like the Latin word from which it's derived. All of these phrases, quiddity, whatness, or what it is to be, signify essence, because essence is that by which a thing is constituted in a certain genus and species, and because quiddity is what is signified by a definition indicating the genus and species of a thing. In other words, when we want to define a thing, that's because we're asking what the thing is. In other words, we're asking for its whatness or quiddity. But that in virtue of which we're able to answer the question, what a thing is, is the essence. Thus, quiddity, or whatness, or essence, all signify the same thing. The word form can also, in some cases, though not in all cases, signify the same thing as essence. That's because, by an essence, a thing has a certain stability, or changelessness. What a thing is must be the same over time for the thing to remain in existence. For instance, what a dog is, is the same a hundred years ago, three thousand years ago, and today. Here, when St. Thomas says that form means the same thing as essence, he's not talking about substantial form, but form and matter taken together or the substantial form of an immaterial substance, that is, a substance with no matter. In material substances, the substantial form is not the essence, as we'll see. Nevertheless, form can sometimes signify the compound of both form and matter. In that case, form means the same thing as essence. Another word that means the same thing as essence and which is used quite frequently interchangeably with essence in this book, 
is nature. That's because nature indicates the essence of a thing insofar as it is ordered to operation. Here, we do not mean nature as opposed to artifact or supernatural, but rather nature in a broad sense such that even angels, which are not natural things in the strict sense, and even God, who is a supernatural thing, can be said to have a nature. When we use the word nature in a phrase like natural philosophy, we're using nature in contrast to artifacts, that is, things made by humans, and in contrast to supernatural and incorruptible things like God and the angels. But when St. Thomas uses the word nature in this book, he's using the word nature in a very broad or loose sense, in such a way that it signifies anything that is knowable whatsoever, including God, angels, and material incorruptible things. Chapter 2 of De Ente et Essentia studies essences as found in composite substances, that is, material substances. In Chapter 2, St. Thomas begins by arguing that the essence of a composite substance includes both the matter of that substance and its substantial form. He argues for this conclusion in three ways. First, using process of elimination. Second, by giving an argument from authority, and third, by reasoning. The argument from process of elimination proceeds as follows. The essence of a composite substance is either a matter alone, b the substantial form alone, c the relationship between matter and form, or d the composite of matter and form. St. Thomas then says that the essence is not A, B, or C. Thus, the essence of a composite substance must be D by process of elimination, that is, the composite of matter and form. He says that the essence is not matter or A because essence is that through which a thing is defined, but matter in itself is not a principle of cognition. Likewise, the essence of a composite substance is not B, substantial form, that's because essence is what is signified by definition, but the definitions of material things, that is, the definitions given in natural science or natural philosophy, always include matter, not just form. You cannot define, for instance, a tree without mentioning wood. You cannot define an organism without mentioning organs or parts. Finally, the essence of a composite substance is not C, the relationship between matter and form. That's because relations are accidents, but essence is not an accident. Thus, the essence of a composite substance is the composite itself of matter and form, that is, of sensible matter and substantial form. Next, St. Thomas proves the same conclusion, namely, that the essence of a composite substance is itself composed of matter and form by appealing to three authorities, that is, to Boethius, Avicenna, and Averroes. Boethius was a Christian philosopher and Roman statesman living between 477 and 534 AD. Avicenna, who in Arabic is called Ibn Sina, lived from 980 to 1037 AD. He was a Persian Muslim philosopher and was wildly influential on medieval Western Christian philosophy after his works were translated into Latin. Likewise, Averroes was also a Muslim philosopher. Averroes is called in Arabic Ibn Rushid. He lived from 1126 to 1198 AD. He was highly critical of Avicenna. He was born in Cordoba in modern day Spain and St. Thomas refers to him by the affectionate nickname, the commentator. That's because Averroes was famous for having written large and uh, many commentaries on Aristotle's works. St. Thomas proves the same conclusion 
namely that the essence of a composite substance is itself composed out of sensible matter in substantial form, in a third way. He does this by an argument from reason. The argument proceeds as follows. Premise 1. That according to which a thing is said to exist, that is, to have essay, is the essence. But only com the composite of matter and form, that is, the composite of sensible matter in substantial form, is that according to which a thing is said to exist. Therefore, it follows by the syllogistic form Barbara that only the composite of matter in substantial form is the essence. St. Thomas next discusses how the words for a genus, a species, a difference, and an individual relate to the essence. The examples he uses for these terms are, for a genus, animal, for a difference, rational, for a species, rational animal, or man, and for an individual, Socrates, or usually some other Greek name signifying an individual. St. Thomas will also sometimes use the example body for a genus. Body and animal are both genera, but body is a more remote genus for man, whereas animal is the proximate genus for man. Animal, rational, man, and Socrates all signify the same whole individual, namely Socrates, but do so in different ways. Animal signifies the whole Socrates, but does so by determining only what is material and not determining the proper form or individual matter. Rational signifies the whole Socrates by determining proper form only. Man signifies the whole Socrates by determining both what is material and the proper form, but without determining individual matter, that is, that by which Socrates and Plato differ. Finally, Socrates signifies the whole Socrates, determining not only what is material and the proper form, but also the individual matter by which Socrates himself is set apart from other individuals such as Plato and Aristotle, who belong to the same species. Having shown that genus, species, difference, and individual all signify the same thing, namely Socrates, but in ways that are more or less determinate, St. Thomas now explains the relationship between genus, species, difference, and individual. He says that genus is to the species as species is to the individual. In other words, animal is to man as man is to Socrates. What is expressed by this four-term proportion is the following. Genus is determined by something such that we get a species. And species is also determined by something such that we get an individual. Thus, the relationship between genus to species is that of less determinate signification to more determinate signification. Likewise, the relationship of species to individual is that of less determinate signification to more determinate signification. Individual is more determinate than the species and the word for the species is more determinate than the word for the genus. Thus, it's true to say that the genus is to the species as the species is to the individual. Here's an example. When genus is determined by the specific difference, we get a species. Likewise, when species is determined by the accidental difference in the individual matter, we get an individual. So, the genus closed plane figure is determined by the specific difference with three sides, such that we get the species triangle. That is, triangle is a species of the genus closed plane figure. In the same way, the species triangle is determined by the accidental difference being here, that is, in this place I'm pointing to, such that we get the individual triangle, this triangle, namely the triangle I'm pointing to. So, just as genus is determined by something so that we get a species, so too the species itself is determined by something so that we get an individual. Here's another example. The genus animal is determined by the specific difference rational, such that we get the species man. Likewise, the species man is determined by the accidental differences in Socrates' flesh and bones, 
that is, his individual matter, such that we get the individual Socrates. More remote genera can be determined by differences to become more proximate or specific genera. Here's an example. Animal is the proximate genus for the species man. But if we remove one of the differences from animal, namely sentient, then we will get the more remote genus organism. But if we remove a difference from the more remote genus organism, then we can get the even more remote genus body. Body differs from organism in that organism determines that the body in question is living. The word body, on the other hand, is indeterminate with respect to whether the body itself is living or non-living, sentient or non-sentient, rational or irrational. Body is the most remote genus in this list, but animal is the most proximate genus. St. Thomas distinguishes between two kinds of matter, common matter, such as flesh and bones, and signate matter, such as this flesh and these bones, that is, the flesh and bones I'm pointing to. Signate matter can also be called individual matter or designate matter. Common matter is the matter included in the essence of material things. Signate matter is not included in the essence of material things. Common matter is common to all individuals of the same species. For instance, Socrates and Plato both have flesh and bones, but they do not have the same signate flesh and bones. That is, Socrates or Plato has this flesh and bones, but it can't be the case that both of them have this flesh and bones. On the other hand, both of them do have flesh and bones, even if not this flesh and these bones. That by which individuals of the same species differ is signate matter, not common matter. This should be obvious at this point, since, as we said, common matter is common to all individuals of the same species. So if we need something to distinguish members of the same species, we should look to signate matter, not common matter. Signate matter is matter with determinate quantity. Accidents in the category quantity are what cause the matter of individuals in the same natural species to differ from one another. For instance, Plato and Socrates have different signate matter precisely because Plato and Socrates have accidents in the category quantity, and these accidents cause their signate matter to be divided. Accidents in the category where or place are what cause the matter of individuals in the same mathematical species to differ. For instance, consider two equilateral, equilateral triangles that are of exactly the same size and quality. Well, in order for these two triangles to be two and not one triangle, they need to be in different locations or different places. Otherwise, it's unintelligible to say that there are two triangles rather than just one triangle. Thus, we say that accidents in the category where or place cause mathematical individuals like triangles and squares to differ from each other. But accidents in the category quantity cause natural individuals such as Plato, Socrates, and this tree to differ from one another. There are two ways to signify essence. The first way is concretely. This can also be called signification without precision, or non-exclusive signification. Here are examples, man, human. Both of these words signify the essence of man non-exclusively, or without precision. They are both concrete words. When we signify essence abstractly, or with precision, or exclusively, we use words like humanity. Humanity is an abstract word, not a concrete word like man or human. Concrete words signify the whole individual, such as Socrates or Plato, without determining that by which the individual is individual, that is, signate matter. 
Thus, concrete way, the concrete way of signifying the essence signifies the individual as a whole, or ut totem. This way of signifying the essence results in a word that can be predicated of the individual. For instance, we could say Socrates is a man, Socrates is human. Notice that human and man are being predicated of Socrates. This is possible precisely because both human and man signify the whole individual, albeit indeterminately. In contrast, the essence signified abstractly signifies the whole essence, common matter and substantial form, but determinately excludes signate matter, which is a part of the individual. Thus, we say that the essence signified abstractly signifies as a part, or ut pars, of the complete individual. The essence signified abstractly does not signify the whole individual, that is, the whole Socrates, because it excludes a part of him, namely his signate matter. We can call the essence signifying abstractly the formal part of the individual. This is not predicable of the individual, because no part is predicable of a whole. Although the essence, signified abstractly, includes common matter in substantial form, it excludes signate matter, and as a result, it cannot be predicated of the whole individual who is composed out of signate matter, substantial form, and common matter. We cannot say Socrates is humanity. Socrates is not humanity, although Socrates is human. Having determined what the essence of a composite thing is, St. Thomas now, in chapter 3, considers how the essence of a composite thing relates to the logical intentions, genus, species, and difference. St. Thomas says that there are two ways in which an essence, or nature, can exist. The first way is in an extramental object, or thing. By extramental here, we just mean outside the mind, that is, an object or thing outside the mind. Here's an example, this tree. This tree, or this extramental object, is composed out of two parts. The nature of treeness, which itself is composed out of common tree matter in the tree soul, or substantial form, and signate matter, that is, this matter. Now suppose that there is some human that is sitting and looking at the tree. The extramental object acts on the senses of the human. Likewise, the human senses, or sees, the extramental object. From these sensible impressions, the human is capable of producing the concept of treeness in general. Here we have the nature of treeness in the soul, or in the mind of the human. Thus now we have two ways in which tree nature can exist, one in the extramental object, and one in the mind or in the soul of the human. This object in the mind corresponds to many individuals outside the mind. We can predicate tree of this tree, that tree, and some other tree, because the concept applies to all of them insofar as it does not determine signate matter, but only determines the common tree matter and tree soul. From these two ways in which a nature may exist, there follows three ways in which a nature may be considered. The first way to consider a nature is in things, or extramental objects. The second way is to consider a nature as it is in the soul, or in the mind. In extramental objects, the nature is individuated. That's because it's joined to signate matter and to various accidental forms. In the mind, however, the nature has the character not of an individual, but of a universal. That's because, as we saw, it's predicable of multiple individuals. Tree belongs to this tree, that tree, and some other tree. 
Since the nature in the mind is universal, it can be called a species, a genus, or a difference, depending on how determinate or indeterminate the concept is. Thus, species, genus, and difference are called logical intentions, or logical concepts. That's because they are concepts that do not apply to the nature outside the mind, but only to the nature within the mind. We don't say that this tree outside the mind is a species, rather it's an individual. But we can say that tree in the mind is a species because it's predicable of multiple individuals. The third way of considering a nature is absolutely. St. Thomas refers to this as the nature absolutely considered. Here we consider the nature ignoring the accidental features that accrue to that nature either as existing in things or as existing in the soul or mind. In this way, a nature is neither universal nor individual, neither one nor many. That's because the only things that can be predicated of it are the things that belong to the nature absolutely considered, or that belong to the nature per se. For instance, we can say of the nature human absolutely considered that it is rational and animal. We cannot say that the nature human is an individual or a universal when we're considering that nature absolutely. Oh, God.